The following video includes the responses that I received back from candidates for the upcoming federal election. I sent the email out on the 19th of May and I was intending on answering these questions myself at the end of the video but I won't have time to do that and I'm losing my voice it's going a little squeaky and whatever but I will read the questions that I asked and then put the candidates responses afterwards so thank you I wrote hello how fast can you think on your feet I am sending an 11th hour questionnaire to all parties groups and candidates for this upcoming federal election my intention is to summarize the points on social media videos presented in a fair manner to all respondents for the electors to see for themselves and vote from knowledge of the candidates rather than ignorance. Once a relevant video is made, then you and your candidates are encouraged to share a link slash embed the video everywhere. I have a somewhat large audience reach, e.g. nearly 3.5 million views on YouTube. The answers can be in dot points where you deem appropriate. Then also just quickly explaining that I did send hundreds of emails but unfortunately I did not get an email to every one of the roughly 2,000 candidates because I don't have their email addresses but I tried. Section 1 provided as representing the whole party slash group or if no party or group then as yourself as an individual. May your party slash group please answer the following questions 300 words max reply size for this section what are your party slash groups top one to three priorities and why then there's section two which is the individual question so when you hear me saying question one oops, answer or whatever then you know what they relate to and how it was also asked section two Please get the candidates to individually answer and to email me, including their name, electorate, state, territory, and word count, the question number before each response. <clears throat> Please include candidate questions and electorate in the subject line. And then it continues. May each of your party candidates please answer individually the following questions. 1,250 words maximum response size for this whole section, that is section 2. Although you can also respond more succinctly if you like. You can emphasize certain sections if you like by writing more on those topics and keeping other topics smaller to make up for it or even skip sections. There are purposefully far too many questions to answer them all besides if dot points and this will test your planning and execution skills. As the list of email addresses I have is incomplete please send to your individual candidates slash friends who are candidates. The point is for you to show your opinions on those topics and why you feel that way, not about me judging or what not. There are some extra questions as stimulus material too. One, what if anything should be done about Julian Assange? Why? Two, what if anything should be done about Ukraine, Russia, NATO? Why? Three, last week a Chinese spy ship was uninvitedly within Australia's exclusive economic zone. What, if anything, should be done about that or about China and their allies within the region generally? Why? 4. If elected, what will you do for your local area? Why? 5. What have you already done for your local area? Why? 6. Australia spends lots of money on foreign aid. Recently, the Solomon Islands made a sh sort of military partnership with China. What should we do about foreign aid? Do we get value from it? How can we get better value with it or alternatives? Why? 7. In retrospect, how would you have dealt with the COVID crisis? What would you do differently or the same? How would you handle the next outbreak of COVID or otherwise? Why? 8. What are your thoughts on temporary and permanent immigration flows into and out of Australia? The brain drain. Effects on infrastructure. Would you increase, decrease or leave the immigration rate the same as what it already is? What are the benefits or disadvantages 
of your approach. Why? Nine. What are your thoughts on international slash bilateral slash multilateral trade, legal and military agreements? Should we be ready and willing to go to war? Thoughts on military spending, military conscription, nukes to defend ourselves. What military hardware and personnel should we focus on? Why? 10. Should businesses, companies and governments dictate what medicines, drugs, vaccines you have in your body? Why? 11. Should medical doctors and other professionals have more leeway in terms of services they provide, including the ability to go against the grain of normal practice without penalty, e.g. the right of unpopular opinion without being de-licensed, disbarred, banned from practice or otherwise sanctioned? To what extent? Why? 12. Where do you see yourself on the political spectrum? And then, as I explain here, because that means different things to different people, then I define what I mean by that. Due to conflicting definitions, I am defining it here as massive government and complete interference with people's private lives being extreme left, and no government and no government interference with people's private lives being extreme right. Most people being somewhere between those two poles. I will state this definition in the video or videos just so that, you know, people don't get tricked or whatever. And why? What do you think of others who don't have the same belief? What do you think of those that do not? I think I bug it up there and should put what do you think of those that do have the same belief versus those that, that don't. 13. What are your thoughts on the monarchy? Should we keep it? Wait until a certain point in time or thing has been fulfilled, e.g. on the death of Queen Elizabeth II? Get rid of it now? Why? What about... Or 14. What about Australia's innovation, industry or economy? Why? 15. Banking, housing, community housing, environment, fuel and other energy concerns. Water. Should we build the new Bradfield scheme? Pumping... And then in brackets... Pumping water inland from where excessive water falls, terraforming the interior, but maybe at a cost to fresh water and estuarine species. Should we have nuclear power, more solar, wind, geothermal, coal, gas, etc. power plants? So Bradfield scheme in particular is in North Queensland, you have a lot of water that gets wasted. You also do in Northern Territory and Western Australia, but obviously it's more population uh, on the Eastern Coast. You also have the Great Dividing Range, and basically there's a lot of rain on the coastal side, but not much on the other side. So there's a lot of water that is either wasted or environmental flows or whatever way you want to call it, that goes into the water, makes the water semi-salty, brackish, that kind of thing after it's obviously fresh water. So the idea is to put pipes and use gravity with the new Bradfield scheme instead of the old one to have water run on the western side of the Great Dividing Range to terraform or you know, make green water, whichever way you want to call it, the interior east coast of Australia. And then, you know, if that works, then obviously you can do it elsewhere too if population's growing and giving place for people to expand, have children, more immigrants, whatever way you want to do it. Sixteen. What are your current, past, future hobbies, assuming that you have time to do them? Seventeen. What else would you like to add and or answer? Why? Thank you and best of luck for the elections, RJ Martin. And before I, you know, continue with the actual uh, responses, then uh, it would be helpful if people have been considering signing up to, say, Amazon Kindle. You can get a free trial. I'll put a link in the description with an affiliate link. And, you know, if you do so, then I can potentially get $5 from each person that signs up, as an example. And I may have some other affiliate links in other videos where people can, say, purchase a book that I'm talking about or mention in a video. 
etc where I might get 2% or something like that from Amazon of the purchase price but every dollar helps I am in a dire financial situation at the moment but you know that's my own problem if you wish to help you can if you don't want to then that's fine thank you and enjoy so I'll just uh, skip through some I think the COVID restrictions didn't work and that they are unlawful in Queensland as an example under section 47 and section 49 of the Statutory Instruments Act that have not been complied with. Victoria has similar subordinate legislation act and it's a bit different in some places in terms of uh, say New South Wales you have Brad Hazard the health minister that actually comes up with the direction so that's a different story but ultimately they weren't helpful. There have been epidemiologists such as Professor Israel, who funnily enough is from the country of Israel, that compared jurisdictions or countries or states or whatever with harsh restrictions versus, you know, along the spectrum of no restrictions. And it made absolutely no difference uh, as in statistical uh, difference. Then I also was Australia's first COVID restriction protester, but, you know, people can have their own opinions. Skipping through a bit more. So I don't believe that businesses, companies, or even the government should force people to have certain medical procedures to keep their job or, you know, participate in society. There may be some exceptions for that. Some people may think that, you know, soldiers should have XYZ vaccine so that if they go to war that they don't get affected by XYZ disease. But then the converse of that is we have things like the Gulf War Syndrome, uh, which is closely linked to squalene uh, or oil basically from shark's livers uh, and other products within the anthrax vaccine. And another alternative, maybe it's not even to do with vaccines, but it could be depleted uranium rounds, as an example, that were used extensively in the Gulf, the Middle East, etc. Because obviously depleted, depleted uranium is a very dense material. When it hits a tank, it just shreds through it and basically makes it explode uh, with little radioactive particles going everywhere and setting everything on fire. But... You know, it is a very effective weapon, but it does have long-term consequences. So it's sort of like Agent Orange in Vietnam, just as an example. I believe that doctors and other professionals should have more leeway in terms of, you know, they are experts. You may have a doctor who's been a doctor for, as in medical doctor, for 40 years and has seen thousands of patients and knows that XYZ is good or effective or whatever or independently researchers or you know looks at existing research and says hey look i suggest that you do try this mr so-and-so miss so-and-so mrs so-and-so or whatever or for your child uh, there is you know this alternative there are these benefits and detriments that are noted and you know it's up to you as a patient to make your fully informed consent. And a part of that is to know all of the advantages, disadvantages and alternatives to a reasonable degree. So you don't need to say every single alternative that exists. You could hold your breath now and then you won't die of cancer because you'll suffocate now, something like that. But you get the idea. And that's even in normal medical law, but it's nearly never applied. When you go to the doctor, go get a vaccine or whatever, they just say, yeah, just take it pretty much, but they don't say about any adverse effects or whatever. Same as, you know, if you have children and, you know, as soon as they pop out of the mother, then they're like, let's inject your kids with different stuff. And they don't tell the patients any potential negative side effects or anything like that. And they don't give the vaccine insert that has, you know, reported side effects through VAERS and whatnot, but anyway, uh, with the monarchy, uh, then you know, Australia 
is a constitutional monarchy and it does have many benefits and I'm loyal so that will pretty much cover everything besides uh, the hobbies and I am skipping over these answers myself because I have to do other things and get this video up and running and you know formatted and rendered and blah 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 but about hobbies I used to do bagpipes and uh, I like filmmaking, doing documentaries, researching a lot of things from different fields and you know from even things like cryptocurrencies are an interest for me and drones as in you know for photography or photogrammetry or whatever. You know, you can make maps and 3D models and do thermal imaging and all sorts of cool things with drones, as an example. But I have very many hobbies, uh, and unfortunately I don't really have a chance to do many of them, due to time constraints and having to work on legal cases and whatnot. But anyway, please uh, like, share, subscribe, and I will press play now. So, Tracy Tiranen, as you would say in Australia, or Tiranen in Finnish, it is a Russian surname, but mostly found in Finland, and I did live in Finland for a little bit. She writes, Dear RJ, thank you very much for this kind offer. However, my electorate is extremely large, and I am on the road and have been non-stop since 5am Thursday morning to to meet and thank my party members for their hard work in helping me in this election. As a leader, it is important to me to thank and let my team know that they are appreciated. The most important item for me is that we get our freedoms back first and foremost, as without our freedom, all these other issues can't be dealt with anyway. And she is running for the United Australia Party for the seat of O'Connor O'Connor is a very large electorate, some 1.127 uh, million square kilometres, so larger than some countries, but it's very important, I think, to acknowledge as well that the seat is named after Charles Yelverton O'Connor, or C.Y. O'Connor. He was a very important person who unfortunately killed himself due to bullying, including from politicians and the press. And his claim to fame is he, one, designed Fremantle Harbour, and two, he designed and created the gold mining uh, areas in Western Australia, them being actually watered, uh, so the gold mine water scheme and basically what happened there was uh, you have you know Perth over here and maybe I should put a map up but you, know, you get the idea so Perth uh, there's a big weir there or a big dam and basically it was to pipe water across to two massive gold mining areas Kulgadi and Kalgoorlie Now, the press and parliamentarians uh, were bullying him, saying it couldn't be done. It was such a massive scheme. It was back in 1902 when C.Y. O'Connor killed himself. And he basically got on a horse and then rode it out into the sea and then drowned with the horse. So that's a shame. But within 12 months of him killing himself, the scheme was actually approved and then it was built and the miners within the Western Australian Goldfields area have a lot to be thankful for as well as the state of Western Australia and Australia for the economic development. The seat of O'Connor is currently held by the Liberals and it is important to compare the New Bradfield scheme to the CY O'Connor scheme the Goldfield Water Supply Scheme. Good luck, Tracy. 
we have Scott Robson, independent for Melbourne. His top three priorities are small business, small government, and big middle class Victoria. In regards to Julian Assange, he would advocate for his release immediately for the Russia-Ukraine-NATO conflict. He says, this is a UN war. We need to advocate for peace, not war. Question three, he answers, our military needs to defend our sovereign borders by all means necessary. Start with diplomacy. Number four, support the vulnerable, starting with those on our streets. Reduce as many laws as possible, starting with their antiquated laws. Five, community support and advocation for our vulnerable. So that's what he already does in his community. Six, let's look after Australia's problems first. Solomon Islands is a sovereign country. They can decide for themselves what is best for them. Seven, in relation to COVID and other pandemics. Same way we dealt with previous coronavirus pandemics, including SARS-CoV-1, H1N1, MERS, etc. MERS is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, for those that don't know. Protect the vulnerable and get out of the lives of the healthy. And H1N1 is a flu, just so you know. Number eight, reduce government controls on the middle class, build our middle class, this on its own will make Australia hospitable and a location of choice to live and work. Nine, be very cautious when the answer is we give our wealth and power to a small group of unelected ultra elite. Think again. Ten, absolutely not. That should be a personal and informed choice between doctor and patient as it always has been until the WHO and Bill Gates, etc. change the dynamics. 11. Yes, patients can choose the doctor and procedures that they choose. 12. We are more intelligent and complex than defining ourselves into left-right. Our left-right duopoly has become a trap for the mind and our choice, vote independent. 13. Politics is too important for politicians and they need oversight. If not the monarchy, then we need a better system of governmental oversight. 14. Too much regulation and control on small business and not enough control on predatory big business. 15. We need sustainable baseload energy. Without energy, we all live in poverty. 16. I am raising five young children. So that's his hobbies. 17. Final thoughts. I believe in protecting minorities, and the most vulnerable minority is the individual. At the individual level, we are all equally vulnerable, and the individual needs ultimate protection. We need to recognise that global mega-wealthy elites do want to own everything and create a global communist world where we are controlled, tracked, traced, and have no power. This is a small and uninspiring future for our children, and we need to make sure we know where we, as Australians, want to go. Critically, Australia needs a free and curious media. The censorship and propaganda of ideologically driven and owned media is creating a dystopia. So the division of Melbourne is obviously named after Melbourne City, and Melbourne City is named after a former British Prime Minister, William Lamb, the second Viscount of Melbourne. He was Prime Minister twice succeeded and preceded by Robert Peel. Robert Peel is famous for modernising the police force, you know, Bobbies, uh, in the UK, are named after Robert Peel with their little special hats or whatever. And anyway, with William Lamb, he was Prime Minister from 1834 to 1834, and then he re-became Prime Minister in 1835, and finished up in 1841. So, you know, sort of the interwar into World War II period, but a hundred years before that. Thank you, Scott. Good luck. Abram Lazutin, who is an Australian Federation Party candidate for the seat of Macon or Macken, however you're supposed to pronounce it. He says, Hi RJ. 
I'm sorry, but your questionnaire has arrived too late for me to even contemplate before the election. Regards, A. Fair enough. Thank you for responding. And with that particular seat, it is a sort of Northern Adelaide seat in South Australia, basically have a bunch of seats around Adelaide and then there's very large seats elsewhere uh, as a general you know, comment. And that particular seat is named after a Labor politician who then became the Australian ambassador to the USA, Norman Macon or Norman Macken, who was the ambassador from 1946 to 1951. It is currently a Labor held seat by Antonio Zappia, or Zapia, aka Tony Zapia, or Tony Zapia. Good luck, Abe. We have Stephen Humble, who is the endorsed candidate for the Tasmanian seat of Bass for the Liberal Democratic Party. So if Tasmania is basically a shield shape with a couple of big islands off it, you have King Island here that's famous for King Island Dairy. Uh, you know, they make some lovely camembert and brie soft cheeses, have pure cows that are, you know, kept in a lovely environment, uh, pest-free, hopefully pesticide-free too, etc. But you have Flinders Island over here as well, named after Matthew Flinders. You also have, uh, for instance, in the New South Wales State Library, they've got the Matthew Flinders section or maybe it's even called the Matthew Flinders Library and you also have the Flinders Rangers named after Matthew Flinders etc he was a famous explorer but the seat of Bass is named after George Bass who was actually Dr George Bass a surgeon and also an explorer he arrived in Sydney in 1795 on a ship uh, who other people on the ship at the time were Matthew Flinders, uh, Woolawarra Benelong, uh, also just plainly known as Benelong, uh, where Sydney, uh, you have Benelong Point where the Opera House is, that's named after Benelong. Uh, maybe he would be an interesting person to do a full story on. Basically he uh, was kidnapped as a boy and taught English and then became a translator for certain, you know, interactions for Europeans and Aboriginal people. But anyway, uh, you also had uh, a famous surgeon, Dr. William Martin, not the same Dr. William Ma Martin or Dr. William John Martin, Dr. W.J. Martin, who discovered uh, contamination in certain vaccines with stealth adapted viruses when he was working for the US Food and Drug Administration as the head of viral oncology. So not that one, uh, but another famous William Martin. You also had Vice Admiral John Hunter, which is one of the three people named John Hunter that John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle is named after. And I forget, who the Hunter Valley is named after, as in, you know, Newcastle, down to Musselbrook, Maitland, Cessnock, that kind of thing. I'll have to look that up one day to refresh my mind. But they are some of the other people that arrived on the ship from London, along with George Bass. So the seat of Bass is that top northeastern corner of Tasmania, including Flinders Island. So Stephen says, Hi, thanks for the questions. It's Stephen Humble replying. Sounds funny, like humbly replying. I am running as a candidate for the seat of Bass in Tasmania as an endorsed candidate of the Liberal Democratic Party. Please see answers to all your questions below. Uh, and just confirming I haven't received so far or haven't seen a response so far for the three major points of the party, uh, which was supposed to be, you know, for basically the party to address and then get these section two individual questions from each candidate. So for question one in relation to Julian Assange, our Freedom Manifesto mentions Julian. We want to get him released. He's a journalist and not committed a crime. Two, we are reluctant to intervene directly 
However, it would be fine to sell them equipment for their defense if they meet the normal export requirements for such items. That's in relation to Ukraine, etc. For question three, which relates to the Chinese spy ship found within the Australian Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ, off of Exmouth in Western Australia. A lot of other people say Exmouth, but same difference. Stephen writes, unaware of the incursion into the economic zone, it's quite legal as long as it's not for fishing or mineral processing, etc. It is 100% legal for foreign nations to pass through these economic zones. Many nations have spy satellites. We probably have submarines spying on other countries too. The general strategy would be to make them aware we know of the presence and observe them to ensure they are not conducting illegal fishing or drilling for oil, etc. Four, the local area that would be an area where feedback is received of federal policies, such as costs of taxes or harm caused by federal border rules and how it affects local businesses. So obviously that's uh, relating to you know, COVID borders, that kind of thing. And basically Stephen saying, you know, he'd ask the electorate what they think of certain federal policies and make his decisions based on that. Five, what have you already done for your local area? As I'm not currently elected, so what I can do is very limited. I have responded to some government public feedback on issues of interest. Six, Australia should minimise foreign aid expenses and focus on economic partnerships with favourable trade terms. So uh, that's also called, uh, you know, foreign aid via trade. And that's a very interesting topic. Seven, in relation to the handling of COVID outbreaks, etc. The approach should be informational and minimise impact on everyone. Public measures should be voluntary. Government response would seek best measures which do not cause economic impact or restrict freedom unreasonably. Businesses could stay open by meeting reasonable and proven OHS regulations to reduce the spread of infection, for example, screens at cash registers. Employees with suspected infections could take leave or wear face masks if symptoms are not clear, wash hands, etc. Whatever is reasonable and shown to work. 8. Immigration would probably be similar and favour immigrants with skills there are helpful and oh, that are helpful and citizenship would be granted only after people were demonstrated as contributing to the economy. 9. Military spending should be defensive in nature and kept minimal. It should require a two-thirds parliament majority for Australia to enter a conflict. We should not have conscription, however service in the military either as a volunteer or full-time would be favorable to people seeking citizenship so you know you get bonus points for serving in the military uh, this is just my little edit part that is also what Rome used to do you couldn't become a citizen if you weren't born a citizen unless you actually did military service and America also has you know expedited military or expedited citizenship for military service. Continuing on with Mr. Humble's response. Nuclear weapons are expensive and not required. Nuclear technology should be for peaceful purposes like power generation, though not opposed to nuclear-powered ships or subs if it makes strategic sense. Australia seeks to phase out manned vehicles and use more unmanned fighting machines like the Predator drone aircraft and new underwater drones, smart cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, etc. in relation to the military. 10. Government should end prohibition and move to legalisation in a staged and sensible way. So that's to do with, uh, you know, should the government dictate or businesses dictate certain medicines, drugs, vaccines in people's body. So it does seem that Stephen is maybe talking about uh, marijuana as an example, just from the response, but, you know, he can clarify that. 11. Where a doctor offers experimental or non-recommended treatment that should clearly be disclosed, 
Medicare only covers approved items. Private health insurance can do as they like. 12. I am both left and right as libertarians seek to maximise social freedom as well as the private economy and economic freedom at the same time. Government regulations should be devised to encourage public sector industry and investment wherever possible and only intervene where it makes sense or by exception. The government rules should enable industry to do more so that the government can focus on its key areas where it makes the most sense. Consider the NBN, National Broadband Network, to be an example of unnecessary government involvement. The broadband access could be improved through other means rather than introducing a government-owned and mandated monopoly. 13. I assign this low importance as it seems to have little effect but prefer to get rid of it in relation to the monarchy. 14. Government incentives or industry slash research funding support should be only in areas where it makes strategic sense to kickstart things. The government should try to design regulations that enable new industry to take place by removal of red tape bans on poorly devised rules. For example, GMO regulations, environmental regulation could be improved to reduce cost of compliance without compromising risk. 15. Government should work to enable private investments in infrastructure, assisting land access for pipelines, desalination plants, power stations, land leases, and construction permits for power, water infrastructure, new, indus new industrial and housing estates. Would like to see a water market similar to the AEMO, electricity market, where buyers and sellers self-regulate supply and demand and pricing, I see the benefits of imported animals to the Australian environment like dun beetles, bees, livestock, new plant varieties and for the conservation of endangered foreign and native species. Humans can have a large negative or positive impact through good management of plants and animals. I support licensed conservation hunting of native and non-native animal species. 16. I am interested in artificial intelligence and robotics research and many other things and have been a member of the Australian Mars Society. Interesting. wonder if Elon Musk has visited the Australian Mars Society. 17. I am good at researching and asking questions, understanding complex situations and seeing a big picture to find ways to solve problems and improve on the present state of things. I am not someone who is happy with doing things as they have always been done in the past if there is an obvious way of doing better but at the same time recognise the benefits gained should be clearly more than the cost of changing. So thank you and good luck Stephen. So I just looked up to confirm who the Hunter Valley is named after and it was named after Vice Admiral John Hunter who was the second governor of New South Wales from 1795 to 1800 and he was preceded of course by Arthur Phillip and New South Wales at the time being the colony of New South Wales basically was all of Australia besides Western Australia. We have Matilda Borden what an Aussie name, Matilda, Waltzing Matilda. And she is the Australian Federation Party nominee for the seat of Spence, or Spencer, if that's how you're really supposed to pronounce it. Uh, with the lady it's named after, she was Scottish, so, you know, maybe it's actually pronounced Spencer, who knows. That seat is directly above Macken or Macon, so you have Macon here, and then you have a bigger area being Spence or Spencer and that seat uh, basically formed in 2018 and before it used to be much enlarged but uh, include more rural areas and it was named uh, the Division of Wakefield not after famous Dr Andrew Wakefield but anyway so Catherine Spence or Spencer became famous because she was an Australian suffragette in South Australia and she was the first female to run for 
I guess you'd say parliament, uh, even though technically it wasn't the parliament, uh, in 1897. So it was to run in the federal convention. So basically you had, you know, elections for different areas and then some people would have just been appointed for the federal conventions uh, which precedes Australia becoming a country or a self-governing colony as it says in the uh, Australian constitution in the covering clauses, clause 8. And anyway, uh, so she was unsuccessful in that. Her brother was uh, successfully uh, you know, elected to parliament at a different uh, time period but South Australia was famous for being the first large jurisdiction area in the West to allow women to vote and that was in 1894 and basically the reason behind that was not even to do with you know women's rights and whatever it was because South Australia had such a small population that basically they thought hey with Australia going to become a nation so to speak, or a self-governing colony, as it really is, then, you know, we want to have double the votes because if we allow women to vote and men to vote and everyone who is already allowed to vote can vote in those elections, then woohoo, we'll have double the votes for our population and double representation. But anyway, so that's just a bit of a backstory. And uh, she was also a famous uh, minister for the Church of Scotland and very vocal uh, there as well. And she was also second in charge of the Victoria, or, sorry, the Adelaide uh, or South Australian uh, women's suffragette movement. Or maybe even the Australian one. Anyway, so on to what Matilda says. She says, last minute indeed, shortest answers I can give with no time left to sneeze or scratch an itch. For her party priorities, the Australian Federation Party, they have restoration of Australia to pre-1975, i.e. that would refer to before Whitlam changed things, you know, you had the Queen of Australia and Commonwealth of Australia was uh, removed from banknotes, etc. Uh, as a result and whatnot reaffirm our constitution with a bill of rights remove australia from any associations with the un who wef which is world economic forum who is world health organization and un united nations and other globalist and corporatist alliances and treaties uh, australia does have a bill of rights uh, that a lot of people don't realize including you know law professors that teach constitutional law such as George Williams who's a professor and you know I got in a lot of trouble at Bond University pointing out the truth but you know that'll be for a separate video but anyway so she says no time for 1250 words so for section 2 I gave that as a limit but said you know you can just do dot points whatever so questions one read Julian Assange he should have been freed years ago and never arrested. He has done more for government transparency than any ICAC or FVEYS, which is Five Eyes, which is a spy network of Australia, UK, Canada, USA and New Zealand. What, if anything, should be done about Ukraine, Russia, NATO, why? Leave Russia alone. Ukraine can never be free. It was captured in 2014. Three... I am no expert on international relations, but it's time to take back Australia. China is becoming the friend you invite for dinner and stays to squat. 4. NDIS and Centrelink reforms to address the deep poverty in the region. 5. What has she already been doing for her local area? 30 years of living in the area and working in the electorate, especially with people in homelessness and poverty and more. 6. With few exceptions, like natural disasters, forget foreign aid in forms of currency slash financial assistance until our own people have housing and employment. 7. The whole COVID mess is a manufactured crisis and scandal. In retrospect, no one should have ever listened to TGA, APRA, Atagi, Who, Gavi, or those affi affiliated with Big Pharma, since not a word of truth or transparency has been uttered from any of these criminal thugs. 
and just for the fact checkers uh, of course you know this is Matilda's opinion and you know I'm not endorsing people's views or not endorsing them in the videos so please don't take the video down eight too long to answer in five minutes I'm already unable to spend the time on this now my parents were legal immigrants fleeing communism I am sympathetic to immigrants and favor legal immigration and would consult with my electorate for a detailed policy on this in the future so I wonder where Matilda's family comes from just because it's interesting nine no time to go into this sorry so that was about the military stuff ten silly question to ask no informed consent dignity of risk duty of care conscientious objection take your pick you now or well, you know all those stupid ideas a free and civilized society might value sarcasm inserted uh, 11 to 12 have been skipped uh, fair enough 13 the monarchy is most of our problem but a republic would be a problem if there is a vacuum to be filled by left-wing nut jobs grafted onto the UN slash WEF World Economic Forum 14 skipped 15 banking etc impossible to answer these now compulsory superannuation is a rort banks are thieves and crooks I have four submissions to the banking royal commission and you can whistle Dixie wonder what her submissions are it'd be interesting to look up uh, Matilda you can post those below the video or a summary of them or whatever I also uh, did uh, do one or two submissions to the Banking Royal Commission in relation to Commonwealth Bank and also the Westpac Bank just so you know uh, 16 uh, her hobbies music opera ballet in another lifetime before I had to be jabbed to watch them live 17 uh, for what you'd like to add she has posted reignite democracy's website with the South Australian results the division of Spence is or Spencer is a labor held seat and Nick champion is the current sitting member will he be the champion again this election who knows a couple of interesting quotes from Catherine Helen Spence when she was speaking of South Australia so she was born in Scotland but you know her adopted homeland was South Australia she wrote as we grew to love South Australia we felt that we were in an expanding society still feeling the bond to the motherland but eager to develop a perfect society and also another interesting thing about South Australia is it's the only colony officially that didn't have any form of slavery in terms of you know convict slavery indentured servitude that kind of thing but that does come with an asterisk because of course it was a part of the colony of New South Wales and obviously when it was part of col the colony of New South Wales it was part of a colony that did have such slave labor even if those people did or did not work in what became South Australia and another interesting little saying was on her 80th birthday in 1905 and she did die in 1910 uh, at the age of 84 and she died in Norwood which is a cool place that I'd like to go to and see some old graves there for a particular reason but anyway she wrote I am a new woman and I know it I mean I am an awakened woman Awakened into a sense of capacity and responsibility, not merely to the family and household, but to the state, to be wise, not for her own selfish interests, but that the world may be glad that she had been born. So that's pretty cool. So good luck, Matilda. So some of my emails have been blocked uh, by, you know, the the system or whatever so that includes to the citizensparty.com.au and as another example 
the fusion party fusion.org.au so no, unless it's gone through to a different email address uh, where there's multiple users of those particular URLs then I probably won't get answers from those people. Monica Shepherd, who is the IMOP or Informed Medical Options Party endorsed candidate for the seat of Richmond in New South Wales. So if New South Wales is sort of like this then the top right hand corner, so north easterly corner, is Richmond. So you have you know the Richmond River uh, some places there are Ballina, I used to live there, Lennox Head, I used to live there, Tweed Heads, I lived there very, for a very short time, and, you know, Lismore, etc. Without a doubt, the most awesome place in all of that seat is at a business or a house at Woodburn, and that is somewhere near Ballina. And basically, uh, if you're driving along the highway, Pacific Motorway, or whatever, if you actually go through Woodburn, because I think they have a like a bypass, and what's the point of bypassing their coolest place in the area? But you'll see a house that has uh, some massive uh, cool statues. Uh, over the years, I've seen giraffes there, horses, that kind of thing, sculptures. And then on the other side of the road, there is a famous Bigfoot or Yeti that famously probably know, 15 years ago was set on fire and it was all in the papers in the area. And uh, basically the person uh, who has that business is Will Ponweiser and he's a fantastic person, great bloke. And he does the most awesome sculptures that I've seen. He used to do sculptures and, uh, you know, props and whatever for the movie industry. I'm not sure what he's doing now. He's probably retired now. And uh, at least from doing most of the work, he's probably still selling, you know, lots of his awesome sculptures. He also once had built a, I think it was a full-size uh, space shuttle in his backyard and apparently people were thinking that he was building an actual one it was pretty funny uh, so you know I've gotten some uh, items from there and I thoroughly recommend going there uh, you also have uh, you know other areas that uh, are around the Richmond River but anyway so Monica said, RJ, I have some videos already made. I'll forward to you for now. I'll have a proper read tonight. I am still awaiting uh, Monica's answers. So if I get them before this video is finished, with all these different little pieces, then I'll include that. But with that seat, it is currently labour held and controlled by Justine Elliott. The seat of Richmond is named after Charles Gordon Lennox. There is Lennox Head in the area as well. And he was the 5th Earl of Richmond. Good luck, Monica. And as I said, if I find uh, other parts of the answers uh, already answered by the time I finish these videos, then I'll just stitch it onto this video. Good luck. We have Tony Moore, who is the United Australia Party candidate for the seat of Fisher. And that is in Queensland around Mooloolaba, uh, Caloundra, what else is in the area? Beerwa, which is famous for Australia Zoo, and Mullaney, which is a lovely area. I used to do uh, monthly uh, meetings going around uh, Queensland, southeast Queensland, and Mullaney was one of the places I went to, and they also got a lovely little waterfall place that apparently, I think it was maybe a day or a week before we went there, someone unfortunately died when they're, you know, sliding on rocks and waterfalls and stuff like that, but it's sad, but it is what it is. Anyway, uh, so Tony says... 
RJ, thank you, but all our policy is online and I do not have time to answer any of your last minute questions. Can I suggest next time send them ahead of time and I'll have someone with spare time to fill it in for you? Uh, kind regards, Tony Moore. And then uh, one thing I'll point out, but you know, it's a fair enough thing with last minute questions, but the point of the questions is to hear from the candidates themselves besides the party section. So just for future reference. And anyway, so he is running, as I said, for the seat of Fisher. Uh, Fisher is named after Andrew Fisher, who was the, officially the fifth Prime Minister of Australia. And he had three different terms in Parliament from about 1909 until 1915, from memory. And uh, anyway... Uh, he is really the sixth Prime Minister. So Australia famously had this campaign uh, with John Howard basically saying, you know, Australia's Australians are ignorant of our history. They know that George Washington's the first president of the USA, but who is the first Prime Minister of Australia? And then they had all these campaigns on TV in ads saying it was Edmund Barton, who is the first Prime Minister, but is really the second. So a lot of people don't realise that Australia's first Prime Minister was William Lyon. He was appointed by Lord Hopetown, or Hopeton, however you want to pronounce it. And it was famously called the Hopet Hopetown Blunder. Basically the issue was that a convention would be that the largest state, or largest colony in New South Wales, uh, in terms of population, their Premier would become the first Prime Minister until you had an election, but people didn't like that and wouldn't form a cabinet with uh, William Lyne because he was, I guess you should say, against the Federation. He wanted the colonies to remain as independent self-governing colonies instead of turning into one great-sized and great you know, self-governing colony of Britain and the Queen. And also the seat of line that had Rob Oakeshott uh, many years ago. He was, from memory, a Nationals candidate and elected to Parliament and then became an Independent when you had Julia Gillard form government when she had less seats than Tony Abbott because she got on side uh, Rob Oakeshott, Bob Catter and... Oh, what's the other bloke's name? Hmm. Tony Windsor. Uh, so Tony Windsor was basically uh, in the Tamworth area and then Bob Catto in far north Queensland and then you had someone who has become a Climate 200 uh, candidate who's a former spy who didn't assist Julia Gillard formed government, and I can't think of his name off the top of my head. I can picture him with glasses, but you get the point. So, uh, line is sort of to the east of Tamworth area, and that's some little trivia about that. I'll just quickly look up, what was his name, Andrew Wilkie, from memory. Yeah, Andrew Wilkie's a former spy that was in Tasmania who is parliamentarian and independent. And he was with ASIO from memory. And that's public knowledge, so it's allowed to be known. He was seconded to the ONA. Does it say anything about ASIO? Mm-hmm. Just having a quick look. Not Australian specialty coffee roasters. Office of National. Just making sure I have the name right. Assessments. Yeah, the Office of National Assessments. Good luck, Tony. 
we have Rebecca Lloyd and she is an independent candidate for the Queensland Senate in voting group H. So you got Steve Dixon first and then Rebecca Lloyd. So Rebecca Lloyd was endorsed by the Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, i.e. One Nation, for the seat of Brisbane. And then uh, she has parted ways with them. And Steve Dixon also was a member of parliament for many years under the LNP and you know the Liberal Party before that. If it's before the LNP, the Liberals and Nationals merged in Queensland for the state parliament and he was a minister he was in parliament for about 19 years in total and then he famously was set up by al jazeera a middle eastern government owned media organization with the whole thing about he got in trouble for saying that you know uh, sunshine coast girls are really good or something like that and then also the gun controversy and whatnot so basically Al Jazeera which may well be espionage because they are a you know government owned organization by a foreign government they set up a thing for many years and then took Steve Dixon over to the USA pretending they're related to second amendment gun rights groups or something like that and then filmed everything and then published that. So that wasn't so helpful for Mr. Dixon. And, you know, the ethics of getting someone drunk uh, to and then, you know, filming them, etc. When you work for a foreign government is a bit interesting. But anyway, uh, Rebecca, I did do a short video on her where I said that basically her comments to One Nation basically made it untenable for them not to disendorse her, uh, which of course I stand by, but Rebecca took it like a champion. She didn't complain or anything like that. She didn't uh, start abusing me like Sylvia uh, Magorovich or defaming me or accusing me of things or whatever. I just say how I see things and it's up to people to take that knowledge and do with it what they like. And anyway... Uh, I think I met Rebecca too many years ago at the Carrara Markets when she had a business. She was uh, writing children's books and she was dressed up like a fairy. Anyway, uh, so she wrote, Sorry RJ, too much on right now with media. Next time for sure, Beck, smiley face. And then I did write back, uh, you know, you can just do dot points, but I appreciate that, you know, everyone is busy. And Queensland is named after Queen Victoria, who was, you know, the first Queen of Australia, so to speak. Uh, not as an official title, but she, you know, signed the paperwork to make Australia a big self-governing colony instead of several small ones, six small ones. And, you know, it's named after her. So good luck, Beck, and also good luck, Steve. I'll also point out that Steve Dixon, along with Monica Smith and uh, Morgan C. Jonas in Victoria, uh, the latter two, that is, uh, have put out a bit of information where there have been multiple people calling the AEC and getting told by AEC staff that if the candidates don't have a name next to uh, the box uh, above the line, i.e. independence, or you can be in a party and nominate not to have anything there. But the people have been advised by the AEC staff members that they can't vote for those candidates, that uh, those votes would be invalid. That is completely incorrect and false. But Steve Dixon just did a video from the AFP, the Australian Federal Police, where he put a complaint in for electoral fraud and he already put in complaints to, or a complaint to, the Australian Electoral Commission uh, some time ago and they responded by saying that someone had uh, basically dobbed him in or made a complaint that his videos don't have the authorisation at the end of them when he is required to do so. So 
i.e., you know, at the end, I put, you know, authorised by RJ Martin, Gold Coast, Queensland. So, anyway, so the one thing I did want to say about that is it is similar to what happened for an election that I was supposed to be in, which was the 2013 federal election. So to keep this video short, I will keep the similar happening from the 2013 election as a separate video because otherwise I'm sort of detracting from getting the candidates information out there. But I'll do that in a separate video, but let's just say that in 2013 there was something very similar happen and I can talk about the results of that in a separate video. We have Kelly Jacoby or Jacoby who is an independent for the seat of Wide Bay. So that includes places like Gympie uh, in Queensland. So, you know, I guess further the way up the coast, something like that. And that seat is currently a Liberal seat held by Llewellyn O'Brien, a.k.a. Lew O'Brien. Llewellyn's a cool Welsh name. Anyway, so another person uh, that I know of is uh, John Woodward who is also running as an independent for that same seat, but I'm not sure if he has responded yet. So going on to Kelly's answers. The top three priorities are end corruption and unlawful rule for obvious reasons. Restore constitutional democracy because our constitution and democracy have been subverted for decades and I'm over it. Support sovereignty, unity and self-reliance because our country is currently crippled, divided and dependent. This must change. This writing is a bit hard to read because it's in white and it's bold with my questions in white too. But anyway, so question one, our government should intercede to resolve this crime. He did nothing wrong. That's about Julian Assange, so I let him go. Two, about Ukraine, etc. Not our circus. We have our own serious issues to resolve. This is a deliberate distraction and mainstream media are presenting the opposite of the truth as always. Three, about the Chinese spy ship. Surprise, surprise, we should stop selling, leasing our country to China, particularly strategic military infrastructure, etc. And deliberately sabotaging our own defence capability um, because China is a massive, obvious threat. Four, my urgent priority is to resolve systemic federal issues as most local issues are symptoms of corruption at the highest levels. And there's also, as a note, a federal election, but a lot of people do care about the federal candidates' opinions on local matters. Even things that are, you know, council matters or state matters, just as a explanation. For what have you already done for your local area? Disability support work, Coast Guard volunteer, active care for people in general, meeting as many individuals from all walks of life and community advocates slash leaders from my electorate as possible to better understand our strengths, weaknesses and hopes to know how I can best affect positive change. Then just as another aside, I used to be in New South Wales Marine Rescue for a few years. So, you know, it's a good thing. If people want to volunteer, I highly recommend that as well. Anyway, going on to six, which is about foreign aid. Wise, effective alliances with suitable neighbours are essential. I see no good management from our current government, only incompetence and deliberate sabotage of our strategic national position. For the next part, which involves things about COVID, it's just Kelly's opinion and fact checkers, please don't delete this video. I am doing an important job of getting the information out to voters just before the election as to the opinions of the candidates. So Kelly says, COVID is an engineered lie from the start to finish, long planned by WEF, WHO, UN, CDC, etc. The CDC is the Centre for Disease Control. In collaboration with APRA, TGA, Therapeutics, Good Administration, etc. 
I would offer ivermectin for mislabeled flu and support natural immunity in those at risk. I would not waste millions of taxpayer dollars on the bioweapon of the decade. I would not allow fraudulent testing for false positives. I would criminally charge all responsible for their many crimes against humanity and treasonous allegiance with corrupt private globalist corporations who have stated clearly many times on public record that population reduction, i.e. genocide, and global control are their goals. 8. Please refer to policy link at her website, so Kelly with an I, Jacoby or Jacoby with an I dot com forward slash about for my angle on these challenges, which is about immigration, the brain drain, etc. Uh, but it's out of the scope of the questions for me to go to other websites and whatever. But you know, that's fine. Nine about international agreements. All must be renegotiated. Current agreements are not in our best interest and haven't been for decades. All very deliberate, planned subversions of our sovereignty and independence. Should we... And then it's got my question she's done as a little sub-question. Uh, should we be ready and willing to go to war? Uh, Kelly wrote, Ready, absolutely. Willing, only as needed for Australia's best interests. And it's got my sub-question, thoughts on military spending. Kelly writes, essential, currently total and deliberate incompetence and mismanagement. Uh, my question about military conscription, she says, no, this violates human rights. We all have strengths and weaknesses. Military service should be for those it is suited to. Many other skills and services are equally important and necessary. Question about nukes to defend ourselves, she says, no. That would be retarded. Perfect for psychopathic morons, though. My sub-question about what military hardware or personnel should we focus on and why. Kelly says, I'm not a defence expert, but as an island nation, I'd say nuclear subs for adequate long-range border surveillance slash protection is a logical priority right now. Reclaiming our ports is a no-brainer. So just as an aside, a lot of Australia's ports are leased on 99-year leases to foreign nations, particularly China. So you have Port of Darwin from memory, Port of Newcastle, uh, maybe some other ones as well. Ten, about uh, should businesses, governments, companies dictate what medicine, drugs, vaccines you have? Kelly writes, definitely not. This violates fundamental human rights, plus Big Pharma is a criminal cartel largely responsible for affecting the global genocide agenda. 11. On should doctors, etc. and other professionals get in trouble if they, uh, you know, make recommendations that aren't officially approved by the government? that aren't, you know, obviously harmful, etc. So she says, yes, completely way to practice ethically, especially when normal practice dictates violation of human rights and crimes against humanity. Hippocratic oath, anyone, first do no harm. 12, she says, I don't see myself as left or right. I value common sense and objective, critical analysis of all matters on a case-by-case -case basis, given best knowledge and and options possible. All are entitled to their beliefs and opinions, right or wrong, or in between. No one has the right to force their beliefs on others. In this regard, wise balance and effective gov governance is the ultimate test and challenge of politics. 13. On the monarchy. The constitution as received under monarchy rule is excellent in principle and would have served us well if not subverted by decades of corruption. I don't see huge value in monarchy rule from here on in, especially under Charles. Perhaps constitutional democracy is the transition we need in the near future. I'm open to all great ideas in this regard. 14. Australia's sovereignty and self-reliance have been deliberately undermined since the Lima Declaration and subsequent communist, in brackets globalist, agendas for the past seven decades. 
This needs urgent attention and repair. There are many possible ways to achieve this, but will take time and excellent strategic management. 15. On banking, etc., she has split it up into my sub questions, but I'll just read it, skipping my sub questions. Reclaim our dollar from foreign control. Prioritise incentivise affordable home ownership over investment property, potentially within sensible limits for community housing. The natural world sustains us all. We must look after it wisely, give an objective analysis of truth, not propaganda from corrupt globalists with hidden control agendas and best, and best options possible. Better solutions are possible and will be found while we transition sensibly towards them for fuels and energy, water infrastructure, changes needed. Yes, for building the Bradfield scheme, but maybe at a cost to fresh... Oh, she split my thing up again. Uh, this risk must be mitigated first, i.e., you know, there are fish that are estuarine, they need brackish water, semi-salt water, uh, etc. Maybe they'll be affected. So Kelly says to mitigate that first and then do the Bradfield scheme. And of course, you don't have to take all the water that's going, you can take a part of it. About nuclear power, this should be considered, but not using uranium. Thorium, non-fissile, 0-5% to waste, and molten salt reactors should be looked into for possible use as safe, efficient, non-polluting sources of baseload energy. With the solar, wind, geothermal, etc. power plants, full life cycle analysis, cost to benefit ratios, better options for extraction, waste disposal and regeneration should be carefully considered first. And just as a side note, uh, Malcolm Roberts, the senator, has recently put out a video where he was asking government heads about the waste products from solar, and possibly you might have also said wind, but I think it was just about solar, but about, you know, you basically have all these toxic waste uh, solar panels that have, uh, you know, certain metals or chemicals in their makeup that you call it doping so you've got n type and p type but anyway i'll uh, skip over that part but it's an interesting uh, thing so for 16 for her hobbies surfing and all things ocean making things reading learning bushwalking live music adventure travel and 17 for anything else you'd like to add That'll do for now. We have an election to prepare for. Smiley face. The electorate of Wide Bay is named after Wide Bay, which is literally a wide bay, which reminds me of a funny story told to me by an Aboriginal auntie or an older lady who's very wise and whatnot. And basically she said, why in New South Wales there's so many things called mile, M-Y-A-L-L, and I don't remember who it was, but there was an Aboriginal man employed by the European, you know, explorers or whatever. And he uh, travelled with them and they went to different places where the man wasn't from. And I'd say, what's this river called? Mile. Uh, what's this uh, lake called? Mile. What's this creek? Mile, as an example. And they thought the name was Mile, as in Mile Creek, Mile River, Mile Lakes area. And it turns out that Mile actually meant in his language, I don't know. So funnily enough, it's I don't know, Creek, I don't know, River, I don't know uh, the name of, the lake, that kind of thing, which is like a funny little story about, you know, why would this person from this little area know what the lake up here is called, as an example, without, you know, asking or whatever. Anyway, I think that's kind of funny. So, good luck, Kelly, and I'll move on to the next person. Thank you.
we have Peter Rogers. For some reason his email is Peter Leonard. I, I know Peter as Peter Rogers, and that's how he appears on the electoral roll, uh, presumably because that is what he appears as a candidate. Although you can have a different name that you're known by, e.g. Lou O'Brien being Llewellyn, or Antonio instead of Tony, or Tony uh, Abbott as an example instead of Anthony. But anyway, so Peter wrote, Thanks for your email, RJ. Uh, all is good, mate. I'm doing this on my own with a small group of people. And I can't sit down and answer all these questions straight away. I'm too busy trying to save our country. You know what I'm all about. And I'm about bringing law and order back into my country for our children and our families and the future of all Australians. Please excuse me, mate. I have limited time to try to do what I can because I'm an independent candidate in the Senate. Trust you understand Peter Rogers. And just for context, uh, you know, I've known Peter online for many years. So that explains the informal language. It is unfortunate for Peter that he is below the line only as an ungrouped candidate because 95 to 99% of people, depending on the election, vote above the line only because it's easier to, you know, vote above the line than below the line, especially in a previous system uh, up until the 2016 election, you used to be able to vote one above the line and then have your preferences automatically preferenced out to other people based on who you voted for, but uh, not since the 2016 election. Now you have to do one to six above the line or one to 12 below the line, uh, and there are some exceptions such as vote saving provisions and whatever, but you know, people are advised just to say one to six or more above the line or one to 12 or more below the line. But anyway, uh, the one sort of exception to most people voting above the line was the New South Wales Senate ticket for 2016's election and Jim Molan received some 10,000 odd votes below the line because he wasn't on top of the ticket and the National Party said, hey, vote below the line for Jim. And Jim Molan is a uh, retired Major General. So for Australian Army uh, rankings, uh, in terms of importance, you have basically four general roles and then a, a field marshal role, which is like a five-star general, which we haven't had since World War II from memory. And we haven't had general, which is four-star general since World War II from memory again. But you have Brigadier or Brigadier General, some people call it because that's the equivalent. And then Major General, Lieutenant General, General, and then Field Marshal is, you know, arguably your Marshal's not even a General, but other people say it is. And just to clarify any confusion, uh, retired Major General Jim or Andrew James is his real name, Molan, so A.J. Molan. He uh, was not actually elected in 2016, but then when a different senator retired or moved on or whatever, then Jim was appointed to take that place because obviously the people had, you know, gone out of their way to say, hey, we want this bloke. And there was some controversy about, you know, claims about SAS and whatever in Afghanistan, supposedly doing war crimes and whatever. So he did suffer some backlash because of that. And that, from memory, might have been why he was put down on a ticket. But anyway, so you get the idea. So good luck to Peter and move on to the next candidate. Angela Kettas. Sorry if I mispronounce your surname there. She is running for the Informed Medical Options Party for the seat of Patterson, which is basically around... So you've got Newcastle here. It's got a bit of Newcastle, uh, Port Stephens, uh, Maitland, northern part of Cessnock, Curry Curry, that kind of area. That is currently held by the Labor politician Meryl Swanson, and she used to work uh, 
with me, like I used to work at the same uh, company as her, which was Radio 2HD and New FM radio stations in Newcastle at Sandgate. And then she famously quit on air, which was interesting. Apparently she locked herself in the, you know, the radio room and was saying some interesting things about management. So it's my little claim to fame there. And I did run previously in the seat of Hunter, which was covering, you know, that area. I did say about Hunter versus the seat of Charlton. And anyway, uh, so it's quite a lovely area there. And I'll get on to what Angela says. So she said, Hi RJ, I appreciate what you're doing, but I just can't see myself getting to this task before the weekend. And that's fair enough. I have opted to provide this short blurb about me in the hope that it is of some assistance to you. Angela Cattis is passionate about truth, transparency and accountability in government and media. She is your voice for sovereignty on all levels, including personal, digital and national. Angela Caddis will continue to defend every Australian's rights to choose or refuse any medical products or procedures without discrimination. She will continue to fight for your democratic right to work, open your business and travel without interference of bureaucrats. Angela will promote local organic food and farming, including an independent environmental impact review of all government approved pesticides, insecticides and herbicides. She will call for a halt of 5G rollout until independent studies and safety levels are assessed on human and animal health and environment. In addition, she will investigate safe, economical and environmentally sound energy production in Australia. Her mission is to stop the poisoning of the people and the planet in order to achieve healthy people and a healthy planet. Her background is in health and law as a registered nurse and barrister. For the past 10 years, Angela has worked for an independent school, supporting it in all aspects of school safety and child protection. Angela Cattis is your voice for health choice. Many people are enjoying this humorous video Angela shared on Facebook. And I'm yet to watch that, but I'll watch it after I do this little clip. And you can meet Angela at multiple events and or visits at, you know, insert website for IMOP, which is imoparty.com forward slash Angela-Kettis, but that's out of the scope of what I'm doing. And interesting couple of things. Uh, one is about the truth, transparency and accountability. That is the catchphrase of IMOP. And interesting that she's a barrister. I will assume that she's not the barrister or the lawyer that advised IMOP that the voting age is 21 for Australian you can't be a candidate if you're not 21 you can't vote if you're under 21 as per the Sylvia Magorovich video that I did which is Tinlo 174 which you can watch I'll put a link in the description so I should say about the seat of Patterson's name it's named after A.B. Patterson or Andrew Barton Patterson also called Banjo Patterson, who wrote some famous uh, stories and poems and songs and whatnot. Uh, you know, you have Waltz and Matilda, the uh, Clancy and the Overfall, sorry, Overflow, Clancy and the Overflow. If you get out a $10 Australian note and look at the little tiny micro writing, uh, they do have, you know, a little poem on there and... I won't spoil the surprise, but you might need a magnifying glass. Anyway, uh, good luck, Angela. Next, we have Thor Prohaska, who I've known on the internet for many years. And he is running as an independent for the seat of Dixon, which he has done many times before. And he wrote... Hi RJ, I would love to answer in full all your questions. However, as an under-resourced independent at 1am in the morning with stuff to be done for pre-poll tomorrow and prepping for election day, I just can't manage it. 
the best I can do is share my personal policy positions page uh, and then it's got a web address sites.google.com and it's quite lengthy and my campaign page so uh, I don't have time to look at that either but it's some points about the seat of Dixon so it is northwestern Brisbane so it's got some places like uh, Fernie Grove, Kalinga, whatever. So, you know, Brisbane's like that. It's like a big sort of chunk like that. And it's named after Sir James Dixon, who was the 15th Premier of the colony of Queensland. And he was Australia's first Defence Minister under Barton's, uh, you know, first federal ministry. Because, as I said before, that basically when William Lyon was appointed Prime Minister, he couldn't form Cabinet because people weren't going to work with him because of the look of, hey, look, you were advocating for not colonising uh, or federating, I should say, Australia into the one self-governing colony, so we won't work with you. Oops, I accidentally said Fernie Grove or Fernie something, but it's Fernie Hills and Albany Creek. I think I said Fernie Creek by accident. But anyway, just correcting myself. Oh, and then also I remembered from a few years ago that Thor had a program that he was trying to do, like an app called Vote Wrap. So I'm not sure what ended up happening with that, but perhaps you can find out and put it in the comments. Thank you. Anyway, good luck, Thor. Next, we have Julie Collins for the New South Wales Senate. So there are two Julie Collins running in this election. One is an incumbent ALP member for the seat of Franklin in Tasmania, but this is a different Julie Collins. This is Julie Collins independent for the New South Wales Senate. And she, unfortunately, also has the same issue as Peter Rogers in terms of uh, being an ungrouped candidate, so you can only vote for her below the line. You can't vote above the line. Julie says, Thank you so much for doing this. First of all, let me just say that it is imperative we bring change. I have just seen another Australian mother and child lose their case this morning, and the child is being sent overseas, not to the father, but to be a ward of a communist court. Despite the mother having an application to the High Court of Australia pending, I am gutted by our politicians and their refusal to intervene to protect children and parents from systemic abuse. This includes grandmothers, grandfathers, fathers, mothers. It is not a gender issue. If we do not bring change by voting in those that will stand for what they believe in and for the good of our nation, we are in dire straits. Please find attached my answers to the questions. My word count is 330 for part A and under 1250 not including your questions for part two. I have full or I have a full outline of my policies on my webpage www.juliecollinsnewsouthwales.com and New South Wales as in NSW. So J U L I E C O L L I N S N S W dot C O N. So she's kindly provided a PDF. Section one, uh, so asking what the three priority areas or whatever are. Let's zoom in here. So transparency and accountability in the top three areas. ICAC investigation, including into the government and attorney general's department. We have seen corruption in the government and it needs to be cleaned up. Some examples I have seen firsthand are, I'll just rotate the phone here to try and read it better. Scott Morrison has made promises approximately 15 years ago to bring change in a Royal Commission to the Family Law Courts and failed to do so. The Attorney General, Michaelia Cash, has said there is not enough public interest to protect vulnerable women and children from domestic violence and paedophilia. And uh, just explaining again, 
for legal purposes, this isn't my claims. This is what the Julie has suggested. So I'm not sure about those particular claims by Michaelia Cash. And, you know, I just need to put that in there. Pauline Hansen's Senate inquiry into the family law courts emailed me and asked me to remove or modify my submissions as they did not reflect well upon the family law courts and facts, which is family and community services in New South Wales. I have evidence to support these allegations. Barnaby Joyce said in May 2021 to me that he won't fight a battle he can't win and therefore intended to do nothing about the family law courts. So again, you know, uh, that's what's Julie, that's her, you know, what she's putting across. I don't uh, endorse or disendorse or whatever anyone's opinions in here. Uh, I'm just reading their responses. So, two is COVID-19 response. We need Royal Commission's and action into the COVID-19 response, we need the federal government to write federal legislation to overwrite the mandates at the state level. The legislative change, oh sorry, and legislative change to prevent what we have seen in the past two years happening again. There needs to be compensation made to those who have lost their jobs because of mandates either in the way of tax relief for the next so many years or in a lump sum payment. Three, Australian Family Law Courts and the Hague Convention immediately change four bits of legislation that will immediately stop the he said, she said and stop the harmful removal of children, abolish the Family Law Courts the way they operate now as part of the ALRC recommendations, which is Australian Law Reform Commission. So they make suggestions about, you know, how we can improve law. So just to explain. Uh, put a halt to the Hague Convention temporarily until recommendations are implemented. A Royal Commission with evidence and accountability. All Royal Commissions and ICAC hearings will be open to the public and documents subpoenaed will be redacted and available for viewing. So... I'm not sure if it's supposed to be non-redacted, but anyway, uh, just to explain too, the Hague Convention is like an international agreement uh, concerning how law processes are done. So just say, you know, if you're a Canadian and you are suing someone in Australia, how that works as an example, or if you want to, uh, you know, subpoena Facebook as another example. Anyway, moving on to section two. Question one about Julian Assange. He should be brought home. He has done enough time for doing his civic duty. Two, I would be open to discussions with other politicians on this. I have mixed feelings, but I know that we need to fix up the problems in our own backyard first. That's in relation to Ukraine, Russia, etc. Three, about a Chinese spy ship. They should not be in our waters and we should not be leasing or selling any of our assets to them. We need to reclaim our land, our water and prioritise Australia. Four, I will be working with the House of Representatives candidate in assuring that we have legislation in place to protect our families and children's rights or children's right to raise our children in line with our culture and values and that will include protecting all schools rights to employ people who are in line with the core values and beliefs of that school including Steiner schools, Christian schools and Muslim schools. I will be looking at ensuring our freedom of speech is protected that's in relation to the local area hence her saying you know working with the House of Reps candidate for that area that kind of thing. Five, what she's already done for her local area and why. I have been lobbying for change for 10 years and was the founding director of Shiloh Ark of Hope, a harm prevention charity and a children's contact centre 
with a difference to ensure that both parents get to see their children and accurate reports are made to the courts to try to prevent the wrongful and harmful removal of children. All of the workers in this organisation are professional and volunteers. Shiloh's a cool name. Uh, look up a Shiloh Shepherd for fun. Like a big German shepherd. So, I well, know it's beside the point, but uh, with German shepherds, they were nearly all slaughtered during the World Wars. So then someone in America, in a place I think called Shiloh, uh, tried replicating what a German shepherd used to be like, which was a lot larger than the current ones, because basically only the runts of the litter were left over, and then they bred and made small dogs. So then German shepherds were bred with huskies to try and make it the original format of a German shepherd, as in, you know, this much taller at the shoulder and you know, that much longer, six inches or so, at the bum end of things, horizontally. Anyway, I'll move on. Number six, about foreign aid, etc. Julie says, I cannot comment on this. I have not had time to give it enough thought. Seven, in relation to the COVID crisis, lockdowns, etc., I would be putting legislation in place that would not allow the mandates, lockdowns, lockouts without it passing both state and federal parliament. A panel that is made up of rotating medical professionals who have written peer-reviewed articles would be consulted. No one on this panel can have any affiliation with pharmaceutical companies. Each professional would be on... Each professional would be on the panel in a voluntary capacity for a six months on-call emergency availability. Then the panel would change. This way it would ensure that there is always an honest agenda. Any recommendations would be open for public scrutiny. Number eight on immigration and the brain drain, etc. I cannot comment. I have not given this enough thought. Nine about military uh, agreements trade agreements, etc. What military hardware and personnel should we focus on why? And she states, I would support a conscription policy. And that can take many forms, by the way, of course. Uh, and you know, we don't have time to get into all the details of that with each candidate. 10. No, it is a personal human right in relation to should businesses, companies, governments decide what medications, vaccines, etc. you take. 11. About medical doctors and other professionals having leeway to, you know, exercise their professional opinions and treatments of patients, etc. She wrote... Yes, they are the ones who have the professional experience and provided that they are doing their professional development, they should be able to form an informed decision. 12. I see myself as more conservative but passionate about freedoms. We should be free to raise our families and have discussions with our children about important topics such as sexuality, gender and pregnancy, etc. This is a parent's right. Parents should be empowered by parenting courses that teach them how to recognise the need, oh, sorry, needs of their children and the development stages of children, for example, the terrible twos and what causes this phase and why. And, you know, Julie can comment below and explain that if she likes. Continuing on. In understanding, we became better able to meet the needs of the child, but still able to hold their cultures and beliefs. I do not think we need to be focusing on gender fluidity at an early age. Studies show that approximately two-thirds of those identified with gender dysphoria had reassigned with their gender by their early 20s. Operations should not be allowed on children to correct or reassign gender while we have such strong studies available. Children should be allowed to play and be themselves. I believe that we should be focused on teaching our children ethics, such as kindness, how to value each person as unique and different, teaching our children how to look at each other and build a team by identifying the strengths in each person. We should have programs that dialogue about situations and actions, decisions and consequences that model healthy responses and boundaries. 
we need to demonstrate conflict resolution and that it is okay to disagree. We need to be employing more male teachers in early childhood sector, increasing wages to encourage more males to look at early childhood, putting in place strategies to offer children a good framework and, oh, sorry, a good framework of tolerance and accepting and knowing how to work with others and choosing to disagree. Many of the problems we see in society today are caused by insecurity and intolerance. This is often a result of early childhood abuse, trauma and neglect. If we offer parenting courses to help parents understand the science and importance of good attachment, this builds resilience, good self-values, which creates confidence in making decisions and good self-esteem and secure people who can feel confident in their decision and understand that a difference of opinion does not mean that they are not valued as a person. And then just a quick comment about that. So when I was 17, I started a double degree or two degrees at once at Newcastle University. I was studying science and teaching and then changed after a year to Bachelor of Business, ended up with that qualification, many from TAFE and as you may know, Juris Doctorate from Bond University most recently. But the point is that when I was studying teaching, at Newcastle University. Basically, there was a conspiracy, if you want to call it, or discouragement for male teachers. So basically, some of the things we were told was that basically, as a male teacher, you're looked at as a male predator of children, i.e. a child predator, and you need to protect yourself. And of course, you need to protect yourself. But if you ever have to speak to a student, make sure the door's open and there's at least two students there. Or if you need to speak to a student privately, make sure you get a female teacher to go with you. All sorts of things like that. And then, you know, if it's, uh, say, early childhood or primary school teaching, that if little Johnny or Jeffrey or Sally or Sue or whoever falls over and, you know, cuts their knee and they got blood pouring out of their knee or whatever, that you can't, you know, comfort the child by hugging the child or anything like that and to go get a female teacher to assist. So that is unfortunate, but that's just my comments on that. I will have to reopen the email. Unfortunately, I had a equipment failure and now that's rectified. I have to find out where I'm up to. So that would have been 12. So I'm up to 13. So thoughts on the monarchy. The response is no comment. 14, Julie says, I would put a tax on all advertising of products manufactured overseas and use that tax to support Australian manufacturing and innovation. I would like to see CSIRO or the CSIRO and other organisations come to the forefront of development of solutions to housing that is flood resilient, or sorry, flood resistant, similar to what Florida has done, fire resistant. So that'd be interesting. Maybe they can just do whatever Florida did or take that as a base research. 15, re-banking, housing, etc. Scott Morrison's idea of people in their 50s downsizing and injecting the money into their super is a one-size-fits-all way to gain control of our money for other people to invest. We should be offering those with larger houses supporting splitting their home if they choose to allow their young adults and families to move in. This is community. The older families, if they choose, can look after and enjoy their grandchildren. Then when they get a little older, the younger generation will in turn assist them. It will mean that the older generation can remain at home longer. We need to look at offering and supporting families and solutions that will assist our older community to stay independent and valued. She has split up my other sort of sub questions as stimulus and I will just read through it where I can. 
So community housing. We need to look at community housing, gardens and supporting families in ways that assist them, including grants to modify homes, work. We need to look at supporting Australian initiatives and local manufacturing will create jobs. We need to regulate the amount of staff replacement with AI. Locally in the area I live in, bank branches have been shutting down more and more and people are encouraged to use automated machines. McDonald's has become automated. These and other areas of service are losing staff to AI. When do we intervene as a government? We have put things in place to encourage diversity at work. Do we need to put a cap on a number of AI vending machines allowed in an organisation or a company? Another important point, to that's just my comment, is that the AI or the self-serve checkouts or whatever, they don't pay tax as well. But you don't have the prices of Woolworths and Coles and whoever else dropping dramatically or dropping at all, generally speaking, even though they could argue, hey, at least we're not increasing prices as fast. But, you know, that's just another interesting thing. And long-term thinking, if everyone loses their jobs, so to speak, and, you know, for illustrative purposes, not literally everyone, but then there's less money to go around, so less people to buy more stuff. So, therefore, prices drop anyway. So... You know, what benefit is it really to just destroy everyone's jobs? And obviously there are areas where jobs can be, uh, you know, replaced by AI, so to speak, and those people retrained and whatever. So a classical example is accountants. You used to have accountants do everything by hand or whatever, and then they got, you know, typewriters and computers and whatever, and now you have myobe, and you just... Or, you know, equivalent programs, and you just forward your information to the accountant at the end of the year, financial year, or every quarter for BAS statements or whatever, and then that is very much more efficient. And then you also have some other jobs where it's a lot safer for AI using automated methods. But the point is that if you do it as a blanket thing where computers are replacing people's jobs or robots are, and there's no replacement for those jobs and it's not like everyone can just you know, become a, a doctor or something like that because if their you know, manual jobs were all replaced and then people say, well, just go to university, then that's obviously not a helpful solution either. But anyway, back to what Julie says. Environment. We need to look at sustainable ways of protecting our environment. We need to stop allowing overseas mines to mine our resources and use our water. We need to recognise that if we damage our environment, it will be out of balance. Whales reduce emissions, trees clean our air. It does not take a rocket scientist to know that if we cut down vast amounts of trees, it will have an impact upon the balance of nature. We need to protect our environment and look at alternatives to plastics, fossil fuels, and come up with creative solutions to provide affordable energy. And my comments again, I'm not sure how whales reduce emissions, but I'm happy for you know Julie or someone else to explain that to me. It's just something I've never heard before. And then also another interesting thing is apparently it was the so-called hippies that got people off of glass as a major product and onto plastic basically it was hey look you can't mine all the sand all the time because it's destroying the environment so why don't we just make plastic out of oil essentially just another interesting thing for water new bradfield scheme etc julie says no should we have nuclear power yes she says uh, more solar wind uh, oh, this is my question about more solar and wind and geothermal, coal, gas, power plants, etc. So Julie says, more hydro using our natural resources. No more wind farms. The byproducts are not recyclable. Begin scaling down on coal, but by supporting local manufacturing and other schemes, ensure that workers are prioritised in these employment areas as we begin to scale down. So, like I said before about Malcolm Roberts, 
with wind turbines their blades are not recyclable currently etc but you know hopefully people can work that out they just carry them to giant dump sites and then dump them at the moment cut them up into three pieces that kind of thing and julie didn't answer about her hobbies and that's fine and what else would you like to add and or answer and why so julie says please see my website juliecollinsnsw.com for all of my policies and some facts about myself so thank you julie and good luck in the election we have greg butler who is a candidate for Eden Monaro, and that is a seat that had a by-election that Ricardo Bosi ran for a couple of years ago. When was that? 2021? 2020, something like that. But anyway, so he is a candidate for the Australian Democrats. The Australian Democrats many years ago had a lady, Natasha Stopped Spoyer, and she was, you know, in Parliament. And you also had a famous guy from South Australia who had the catchphrase, keep the bastards honest. And I can't think of his name right now, so I'll quickly look it up. But basically that party was around until One Nation got formed and then I don't think they've had anyone in Parliament since, perhaps. What was his name? Keep the bastards honest. Australian Democrats. Oh yeah, Don Chip. And then funny story about Don Chip was he was the boss of a committee that was looking at outlawing or legalising pornography in Australia. And because... It used to not be legal a long time ago. And apparently he had all the ministers and parliamentarians, mainly males, maybe there were some females in there too, that would go to his office and then, uh, you know, view pornographic material to try to say, oh, you know, we can't have this. But they would go in there quite frequently, apparently. And the joke was that they'd just go in there, you know, so they could watch what was illegal otherwise, like X-rated films or whatever. So, anyway, also, Pauline Hansen later said, you know, keep the bastards honest, in the words of Don Chip or whatever. So, what did he write? Greg Butler wrote, You have to be kidding. Way too busy to answer now. Need a week's notice if you want a sensible, detailed answer. So I did write back to Greg, dot points or a blurb are okay. But, you know, it's fair enough that a lot of people can't write in that time period. People are busy just trying to check for any other candidate answers. But in politics and in life, you need to make quick decisions. Sinem Australi. Australi. It's like Australia with an E on the end. And Sinem is S-I-N-I-N. Is a lady who is running as an independent for the seat of Fairfax. Fairfax was named after Ruth Fairfax, who was the founder of the Australian Country Women's Association, which is a great organisation. You may have had, you know, their famous scones, or I think they even sold scone mix in the uh, supermarkets afterwards, but uh, another voluntary women's association and, you know, friendship and stuff like that. So again, you know, if you're looking at joining such an organisation, be a great organisation to join. So Fairfax was the seat that Clive Palmer took in 2013 until 2016 and then it went back to Ted O'Brien or Edward Lynham O'Brien his proper name is and he's a liberal the area includes places like Coor uh, sorry Coolum uh, you may have heard of 
you know, call them golf resort, Palmer's resort, where he used to have dinosaurs there, and apparently not anymore, but Maroochydore, some other places like that, so in Queensland, you know, sort of, I don't know, probably a quarter of the way up the coast. So Sinem says, Hello RJ, Sinem Barbara Australia, Fairfax, Queensland Independent. I aim to reverse the current situation where pollies dictate to the people with unfair rules but do not follow these created rules themselves. Under this regime, we have seen corruption that has only one aim to keep the pollies in power. As an independent, my aim is to provide representation in Canberra for my electorate. I aim to provide banking reform so that ordinary people will see a return on their bank deposits that are safely protected and not gambled away by the bank for excessive profits. Without financial security, people will struggle to own their own home. This also includes creating long-term good-paying jobs. With financial security, people will feel mentally happy and thus our culture will be more positive. Then to the individual questions. 1. Julian Assange. He should be returned to his parents and provide protection from the American government. 2. Ukraine, etc. Ukraine slash Russia is not in our hemisphere, so we should not interfere. NATO has destroyed Australia's industry via the Lima Agreement, and we have paid a percentage of our GDP for nothing. So maybe she means the UN. There. But continuing. Three. Australia is an aggressor with the Chinese. We are America's lapdogs. America owns most of our mineral wealth and treats us as uneducated backward children. I would seek to re-establish economic relationships with China. Australia is militarily weak. We would not last long in a war situation and if anyone thinks America will save us look what happened in Afghanistan where they left their own people behind. 4. Aim to provide green power that is reliable 24-7. Then create long-term stable jobs that meet the requirement of the 21st century. I have created and then 5. I have created a positive influence in my community which fosters a spirit of friendship and willingness to help other people particularly dis the disabled. 6. Foreign aid. Foreign aid, first thing we need to do is ask what they want and stay within our region fostering positive relationships by communicating by meaningful dialogue. 7. COVID should have been a medical response not a financial one. This is the first medical situation where healthy people were isolated from their jobs. 8. More immigration in reduces worker capacity to ask for a wage rise. Brain drain, we are not educating our future workforce with the skills necessary to upskill Australia's needs. Until we increase our infrastructure, we will not be able to provide a quality life situation for migrants. My thoughts are we should concentrate on our homeless and underemployment first. 9. No war unless we ourselves are threatened. I would prefer increasing our multilateral trade. We are already militarily weak, so we need to completely reassess our military equipment needs. 10. Every individual in consultation with their doctor should have the right to see the benefits and harms what medication they consume. 11. Not sure what you mean. I do not have enough expertise in that area. So that relates to my number 11 question, which was, just for clarity, about should medical doctors and other professions have more leeway without, you know, risking losing their jobs, that kind of thing. 12. I am able to provide practical politics that hopefully a majority agree, agree with. There will always be black sheep in society as long as they do not hurt others. Their viewpoint can be discussed by its merits or not. 13. I'm a Republican. 14. Australia has in the past been great innovators, e.g. black box flight recorders, scramjet engine, hills hoist, clothesline, 
nowadays not so much but we can again with government incentives to universities and TAFE for individual projects. 15. Banking needs reform which includes a postal bank See my policy at independentrebel.com.au, which is out of the scope of me checking, but you can look it up. I would inquire enlarging two dam sites in my electorate, as without fresh water, people and industry will not survive. I would wholeheartedly support a Bradfield scheme. I would support small nuclear power plants. 16. I'm... Currently a full-time carer for my disabled sister who has spinal injuries as my own children are now happily married. I enjoy reading and gardening. And cinema used to be my mum's full-time carer as well. So cinema goes on 17. An ICAC with teeth that can prosecute corrupt pollies, bureaucrats, judges and all white-collar criminals with real sentences like in America... And then she comments, well, you certainly ask a lot of questions. I would assume you would not be getting very many responses back at this late stage. All the best, Sinem. And good luck, Sinem. Thank you. George Christensen, who was with the LNP and a senator and now is number three on Pauline Hansen's One Nation ticket, writes... Hi RJ, I apologise but I'm so flat out I don't have time to do this questionnaire. On the issue of Assange, I'm firmly in favour of him being released. Regards, George. And then I did write back to him, dot points are fine if you can get a chance, it should be what I wrote, get a change, in the next couple of hours, cheers. And he's a senator for Queensland, by the way. So good luck George and thanks. We have Janine Kitson, independent for Bradfield in Sydney, so the northern part of Sydney. So you have Warunga, Kalara, uh, West Pimble, that kind of area. So just say if you're going from Newcastle, you go down to Sydney and you've got the main turn off, that's Warunga and whatever. And I think that might be where Dick Smith was going to potentially run for election several years ago but then didn't do it, which is sort of a shame. But anyway, uh, also the area Bradfield is named after Dr. John Bradfield. Uh, so we talked earlier about the new Bradfield scheme. So he was a doctor of engineering and for about 42 years or something like that, worked for the New South Wales uh, Department of Public Planning or whatever it's called. And basically, he designed the Bradfield scheme, uh, which is uh, taking the water from northern Queensland and pumping it inland. But then the new Bradfield scheme is where you have like hydrologists and whatever work out that, hey, you don't need such a long pipe. You can just dump the water here, pump it up here, and then it'll drain down there naturally, that kind of thing, just to explain. He's also famous for designing several uh, dams, such as Cataract Dam, and uh, Burrenjuk Dam, uh, which is Aboriginal word meaning mountain with a rugged top on it. Uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, he designed that, even though other people point out that it's basically a miniature, or a, sorry, an enlarged design of Newcastle in the UK, one of several Newcastles in the UK, but they have a bridge that is, you know, pretty much similar, but anyway... You get the idea. I will get on to what Janine says. She says, Thank you, RJ. Here are my answers. Janine Kitson, independent for federal seat of Bradfield, New South Wales. Her top three priorities. Action on climate, because we are in a climate emergency. If we don't act now and reduce carbon emissions by ending coal and gas mining, and exports, we will soon have a dead planet. Federal independent anti-corruption, because we have to stop politicians getting away with blatant con corruption and pork barreling. <clears throat> we need to change election rules to stop millionaires bankrolling election campaigns. And she also has defending our trusted and valued national broadcaster, the ABC, 
or we will unravel as an uninformed society and our democracy will collapse. And I'll just quickly check if Janine's one of the Climate 200 supported candidates. Because it'll give my voice a little tiny rest. <clears throat> so I want Janine Kitson. No, she's not on the list. She should have hit, you know, Mr. Millionaire, Simon Holmes at court, who used to argue with me on Twitter. It was pretty funny publicly, but she could hit him up for some election funding or could have, I should say. Because, you know, he supports the, the climate change initiatives or whatever you want to call it. And anyway, it was pretty funny having an argument with, you know, a billionaire, even though, you know, maybe not a billion, but lots and lots of money. And his father uh, was famously a billionaire. I think maybe was he Australia's first billionaire officially back in the 80s. Uh, Holmes Accord. Let's have a look. That's interesting. Robert Holmes Accord's actual name is Michael Robert Hamilton Holmes Accord. But anyway, South African born Australian businessman who became Australia's first billionaire and he was a lawyer and a businessman. So there you go, and then you got Peter Holmes Accord and Simon Holmes Accord and two others that aren't listed there. But anyway, so she's not a climate two hundred supported candidate. Also, Simon could have sought her out too, of course. But anyway, going on to the individual questions. One, bring Julian home. He is an Australian citizen and journalists should not be punished for telling the truth. Two, everything must be done to avert a nuclear world war. Putin must be politically isolated by strong economic and diplomatic sanctions. The Russian people need to be empowered to end the war. Three, work with China on the climate emergency. That is the biggest security threat for both nations. Four, turn Bradfield, as in her electorate, into an electorate powered by 100% renewables. Five, opposed overdevelopment that has destroyed so much of Bradfield's beautiful and unique and rare natural environment and again just so it doesn't get confused with the Bradfield scheme as in to water the interior she's talking about the electorate in that question six I worked on an Australian overseas education aid project in partnership with the Samoan people it was one of the best experiences I had we need to do more of this that's pretty cool I did potentially have the opportunity myself to go over to Samoa or the Solomon Islands or some other places to basically do some voluntary legal services there, obviously under a supervised lawyer, but I didn't end up having the time to do so. Seven, in relation to COVID and lockdowns, etc., listen to the scientists, build resilience back into essential services that saved us, Support essential workers, support women, support the cleaners, teachers, nurses and aged care workers. Eight, about you know, immigration, etc. We need independent scientific and environmental assessment of whether Australia is in, indeed capable of a big Australia as one of the driest continents on the planet. However, we will have to take more refugees with sea levels rising in the Pacific and other climate catastrophes. Nine. The greatest security risk is climate change. We need to work for peace or we will destroy the planet. Australia should not become an arms dealer. So that's to do with the international trade and military alliances. 10. We need to listen to the medical experts to answer this question, which is about should businesses, companies, governments be able to you know, force certain medications on people, that kind of thing. 11, which is about medical doctors and other professionals having, you know, 
scope or leeway to do what they like within reason uh, e.g you know give a patient xyz or whatever so long as the patient provides fully informed medical consent that kind of thing so she wrote i do not know this answer i will have to research it fair enough 12 about the political spectrum i do not believe in left or right i believe in good people and good policies 13 I would ask my electorate what they wanted me to do about this in relation to the monarchy or, you know, republic or some other form of government. 14. Invest in education and that makes for innovation and a good economy. 14. No, a Bradfield scheme would destroy ancient natural systems that will then create more entrenched problems that we will then be unable to fix. We need to end coal and gas as they are producing greenhouse gas emissions. That is the reason why we are in a climate emergency. No nuclear. Solar is now the cheapest form of energy. Australia's environment has one of the worst extinction rates in the world and we need to protect our environment, not destroy it. 15, about her hobbies, etc. I love reading about the environment and am a lifelong learner. 17, anything else you'd like to add? I can't write any more. I have to get back to the polling booth. So thank you, Janine, and good luck in the election. So that concludes who has actually written a response. There were a heck of a lot of emails from, you know, already incumbent politicians that have the automatic message saying, hey, look, uh, you know, I'll deal with this later. Usually they do say uh, words to the effect of you need to write back your name, address, suburb, that kind of thing to prove that you live in my electorate before I bother answering you. A lot of them say if this is like a mass mail out sort of thing, uh, you know, suggestions or whatever, then we'll acknowledge your information, but we won't respond. Then there was an interesting one from one of the politicians that basically has in the automated messages that they receive thousands of emails from the uh, likes of get up and do gooders and whatever. So basically, you know, someone can log into those websites and then just click a button to send a message pro forma already written out to 5,000 million billion people. Well, really, if you want to be pedantic, then 151 lower house members of parliament for the federal parliament or commonwealth parliament and 76 senators. But then, of course, those websites also would email blast state politicians, potentially councillors, that kind of thing, mayors and whatnot. So that concludes this video. Uh, I have also just checked the spam folder in my email account in case there were other messages that I didn't see and there weren't any. So that's fine. Please like, share, subscribe, consider donating if you can and you can donate to me at paypal.me forward slash RJ Martin, A-R-J-A-Y-M-A-R-T-I-N and then you know i can get better equipment that doesn't keep breaking down and stuff like that better sound whatnot and please have a lovely day please don't forget to vote and have a lovely day bye spoken and authorized by rj martin gold coast queensland